How's it going everybody? In this video, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at our next routing protocol topic, which is gonna be EIGRP. So we're gonna dive into some of the operations and things that we're gonna be taking a look at as we dive into the protocol. So let's go ahead and dive into, the, into all this stuff and get it knocked out. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our whiteboard and we're gonna start talking about EIGRP. So EIGRP in its easiest context. So EIGRP, um, at the end of the day, when we talk about this, it is proprietary, right? So even though there are some informational RFCs out there and the protocol has been opened up to some extent, when you break it down to brass tacks, uh, you really can't run this on Juniper. You can't run it on Arista. It's really just Cisco that you can run it on, right? So most of the environments that I've worked on, they run EIGRP. Simple as that. So because it's Cisco proprietary, you deal with that. Now it does scale well in a lot of different designs, and we'll take a look at exactly how that works as we move into later parts of the, the series. But right now, this is basically where we are at. It is a classless protocol, okay? Meaning that it supports VLSM or variable length subnet masks. It does support both manual and automatic summarization. We will take a look at both of those at a later point in time, later in the series. It is its own IP protocol. So IP protocol 88. Uh, OSPF is 89, in case you have anybody who's concerned about that. So it leverages RTP, and this is not the real-time protocol. This is the reliable transport protocol. What that means, in a nutshell, is that if I have two routers communicating back and forth, so I have R1 and I have R2, and they're communicating back and forth, that they need to make sure that if a update goes from one way or the other, that the other side knows about it. And this is where the actual communication back and forth between the devices works. So for discovery, so if R1 wants to discover R2, you would enable EIGRP on the link between both routers on both sides, so on R1 and R2, just like you would with EI, with RIP. And what ends up happening is you send multicast to 224.0.0.10, which is the well-known link local multicast address for EIGRP. This is gonna be used for discovery. You discover and then you form adjacency. Now, once you form your adjacency, you can then move over to unicast. So now that you know who your neighbor is, you would then send unicast updates between the devices to sync your routing tables and so on and so forth. So multicast is used to discover neighbors and form adjacencies, and unicast is used to synchronize the unicast routing table. Now it does also rely, use reliable multicast with sequence numbers to just and acknowledgements and acts to make sure that communication is working back and forth to synchronize the routing tables and all of the other things that are going on inside of the network. It forms an active neighbor adjacency. So active neighbors. So you might say, what does that exactly mean? Well, maybe you remember when we were going through RIP, where when we set up RIP, you would discover your neighbor, but there was really no active adjacency. Where with EIGRP, when you form when R1 and you have R2, when they form an active adjacency between these routers, right? They form this adjacency. What's gonna end up happening is, on a consistent basis, every five seconds here, you're going to send a hello out and then you're going to expect a hello back, right? If something happens and that hello dies, you're going to wait 15 seconds or basically three hello intervals, right? Three hellos 
if you don't get a response back, you're going to basically declare that neighbor down and you're going to take down the adjacency. It makes it pretty easy to detect whether there's a problem and things like that. What this does is it guarantees a um, that the, your neighbors are up and that everything is working the way that it needs to. So if in the event that you have a peering go down, you can remove that peering and then you can propagate the removal of any routes that you might have learned from that neighbor throughout the rest of the routing table. It does leverage a guaranteed G-U-A-R-A-N-T-E guaranteed loop-free topology. And you might say, okay, why is that important? Well, the reason why it's important, depending on the situation, is if you have R1, R2, R3, and R4, and you have something like this connected, right? Where nobody, there's no secondary path to any individual device. If this is your source and this is your destination, then you don't need a loop-free routing protocol, right? You can just set up static routes everywhere and you're good to go. But the moment you add in this, or this, or this, now you have loops. Now you have more than one way to get to some place. So what you're gonna do in the EIGRP world is you're basically going to figure out who you're connected to and you're going to figure out what their, who you're connected to and what the variables are on a per neighbor basis. So you're basically going to say, what is the bandwidth and the delay on a per link basis? You're going to take all that information in and then the links that give you, you do some calculations using the dual algorithm, the diffusing update algorithm. You take that into, you take that, you run all of the metrics that you've learned from all of your neighbors and all the different paths you have in order to get from point A to point B, and you run them through dual, and then dual is going to spit out the rib information, your routing information base. What routes should get installed into the routing table? And that's really what's gonna end up happening here. So you take the bandwidth and delay, you figure all that type of stuff out, and then you determine how many different ways do you have to get to a particular destination. So maybe you have one link between point A and point B, maybe you have two links between point A and point B, and maybe right here you have three links between point A and point B. So this would be A, this would be B. So in this case here, you could go this way, right? That would work. You could go this way, that would work, or you could go this way, and that would work. But the more links you take into consideration, the higher the end metric is going to be when you take the bandwidth and delay into, into consideration. We'll talk more about how EIGRP figures all that type of stuff out, but what he ends up doing, or I should say what EIGRP does with dual, is it figures out what's going on in the network, and then is going to take the best links and put those as the shortest path to the destination you're trying to reach. That's essentially what's trying to happen here. Now let's go ahead and continue our discussion of how all this comes into play. So the next thing we're going to talk about is basically is fast convergence. So EIGRP can detect a failure just as quickly as any other protocol, right? The major difference between, and this actually kind of ties off to this right here, is when a link down goes down, for example, let's say you have your, your number one link here, this is your best route, number two is maybe your second best route, maybe the third path is your third best route, right? Well, in the event that the first one goes down, right, your first is no longer there, then you have to fail back to your second. Well, what EIGRP is gonna do is it's actually going to calculate the first, second, and third best routes. Most people only talk about this to the second best, or what's commonly referred to as a backup route. Now there's nothing wrong with that, right? Everybody's happy with those values and we can roll with that. But when you have additional links that you might need to take into consideration, you might have a third one. So technically I would have a second and a, uh, a second link for backup and I would have a third one, which would be a secondary backup. Well, you have the ability of taking, going from the first route and then you can fail down to the second route or the backup routes. If you have 
other links or other paths that are maybe a little bit worse, but have a higher com composite metric, which is a combination of the bandwidth and delay equals your composite metric. If you take those into consideration, that's supposed to be a T and an E here. You take the composite metric and then you run that against the links here. You figure out who's got the worst links. He's obviously your worst path, so on and so forth. But what's cool is in the event that the primary link goes down, a secondary backup path has already been pre-calculated. So all you have to do is literally just inject that route into the routing table. You don't have to go out there and figure all out that stuff all over again. Now EIGP does leverage a granular, supposed to be an N, granular metric, right? So we have our bandwidth and our delay, not bandwidth ver divided by delay, but it's bandwidth and delay. There's a couple other ones that are out there for us, but like a load and reliability, but we're not gonna really get into those in this series but load and reliability are options for us as well. We're gonna be mainly focusing on bandwidth and delay. But if we wanted to add in load and reliability, we could do that as well. It does support unequal cost load balancing. I don't recommend doing this. We'll talk about it, we'll ex demonstrate a couple of examples of how that comes into play, but it actually will allow you to send traffic out multiple links irregardless of their capacity. In other words, if I have, uh, let's say I have R1, and then I have R2, I have R3, and I have R4, let me do R4 here. If I go this path here, and this path here, and this path here, and this path here, let's say this is one gig, this is 100 megabits, this is one gig, this is 100 megabits. Well, what I can do is I can send traffic out this way and I can send traffic out this way. Now, is there a bad, is that a bad idea? I, in some most cases, yes. I would not recommend doing unequal cost anything if you can avoid it. What I would recommend doing is bumping these guys up to gig and bumping this guy up to gig as well so you can load balance across all your links. It's uncommon to see it, but it, it's out there. But we'll talk about that and as we get down to it. We do support authentication. So we'll be taking a look at both the MD5 and the SHA based authentication capabilities that are out there. And then we're gonna talk about the traffic engineering with stubs and summaries. That's supposed to be an R summary. And we'll take a look at how you can deal with ACL base filtering, ACL filtering, and stuff like that. So there's a lot to unpack when it comes to EIGRP in terms of its operations and its capabilities, and we'll dive into those details when we get a little bit further along. There's gonna be quite a bit of individual configurations that we're gonna to have to go through and get everything up and running. We will be taking a look at this in both iOS and XR. So if there's things that you haven't dealt with before on iOS, you'll have them now. If you have any questions regarding something or you would like to see something covered, um, chances are that as videos get released that I'm covering something that you probably wanna see, so just be patient and waiting for that to come out. But if there's something that you wanna see specifically and you know you wanna leave a comment, um, I will do my best to accommodate those of you that want to have see something covered that maybe has not been covered or was not on the list originally but I'm pretty much going through the entire protocol. I'm not gonna go super skinny like I did with RIP. I'm gonna go into a fair amount of detail with EIGRP because at the end of the day, EIGRP is a pretty big protocol. Not as big as OSPF, but it's still a pretty big protocol. So please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch all of you in the next video. Thanks guys.